in the shade of the Quran by Ashahid Said Kutu, translated by M. A. Salahi and A. A. Shamiz for World Assembly of Muslim Youth. Surah 103, Surah Al Asr, The Declining Day. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والعصر إن الإنسان لفي خسر إلا الذين Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim In the name of Allah The Beneficent The Merciful I swear by the declining day That man is a certain loser Save those who have faith And do righteous deeds and counsel one another to follow the truth and counsel one another to be steadfast. The short surah of three verses outlines a complete system for human life based on the Islamic viewpoint. It defines in the clearest and most concise form the basic concept of faith in the context of its comprehensive reality. In a few words, the whole Islamic constitution is covered and, in fact, the nation of Islam is described in its essential qualities and its message in one verse only, the third. This is the eloquence of which Allah alone is capable. The great fact which the surah affirms is simply that throughout the history of man there has been one worthwhile and trustworthy, trustworthy path that the surah indicates and describes. All other paths leads only to loss and ruin. As it says in outline that path is first the adoption of faith, followed up with good deeds and exhortation to follow the truth and to that fastness. <laughs> what does the adoption of faith then signify? We shall not give here its juristic definition. Instead, we shall describe its nature and its importance in human life. <coughs> faith is the characteristic by which the minute transient human being attains closeness to the absolute and everlasting originator of the universe and all that exists in it. He thus establishes a link with the whole world which springs from that one origin, with the laws governing it and with the powers and potentialities created in it. As a result, he breaks away from the narrow boundaries of his trivial self to the broadness of the universe, from his inadequate power to the immensity of the unknown universal energies, and from the limits of his short life to the eternity that Allah alone comprehends. This proximity grants that the human being a certain power, limitless scope and freedom. It endows, it endows him with great enjoyment of life, its beauty and its constituents, with whose soul he lives in mutual friendship. Thus, life becomes a pleasant journey for mankind everywhere and all at all time. From this 
everlasting happiness, delightful joy, and true intimate understanding of life and all creation are derived. This is the invaluable gain. This is the invaluable gain to lack, which is an immeasurable loss. The qualities of faith are also precisely those of sublime and dignified humanity, such as the worship of one God, which elevates man above the servitude to others and establishes within him the truth of the equality of all men, so that he neither yields nor bows down his head to any but the one, the absolute. The result is that man will enjoy true liberty, which radiates from within his conscience following his realization of the fact that there is only one power and one Lord in this world. This liberation is spontaneously developed from such an awareness for it is the only logical sequence. Godliness is the second quality of dignified humanity. This quality determines for man the source from which he derives his concept, values, criteria, considerations, doctrines, laws, and whatever brings him into relation with Allah, the world at large, and with human beings. Thus, equity and justice replace personal desires and self-interest. <coughs> this strengthens the believer's realization of the values of his way of life and keeps him above ignorant concept, values and interests and above all strictly mundane values. This is so even when the believer is the only one of his kind, for he counters this features with those which he derives directly from Allah and in which therefore rank highest in value and are the most sound and the most deserving of devotion and esteem. A third quality of faith and dignified humanity is the clarity of relationship between the Creator and the Creator. The restricted creature is connected with the everlasting truth without any mediator. It supplies man's heart with a light, his soul with contentment, and gives him confidence and purpose. It eliminates from his mind perplexity, fear, anxiety, and agitation, as well as unlawful haughtiness on earth and with unjustifi unjustifiable tyranny over people. That fastness along the path ordained by Allah is the next quality of such humanity. This must be maintained so that good does not occur casually, incidentally or without deliberation but springs from definite motives and heads towards certain aims. People united for Allah's cause Collaborate, collaborate. Thus, is a single definite purpose and a single distinguished banner. The Muslim community is raised. This is true of all generations that are similarly welded together. And that the quality is belief in the dignity of man in the sight of Allah. This heightened man's regard from himself and restrains men restrain him from aspiring for a positive for a position higher than that which the creator has defined for him for men to feel that he is dignified in our sight is the loftiest conception he may attain of himself any ideology or concept which abases this valuation and ascribes a dishonorable origin to man separating him from the higher society of Allah is in effect, inviting him to abjection and derogation, though he may not say 
so openly. Hence, the effects of Darwinism, Buddhism, and Marxism are among the most horrid disasters in human nature that human nature has encountered. For they reach mankind that all, or they teach mankind that all abasement and downright animalism are natural phenomena with which we would be familiar and of which we need not be ashamed. Purity of motivation is yet another quality of the dignified humanity established by faith. <coughs> this directly follows the realization of man's dignity in man's sight, in our sight, the supervision of a man's conscience and his knowledge of the innermost undertaking. The normal human being whom the theories of Freud, Karl Marx and their type have not deformed is bashful, is bashful that another human being may come to know which, incident, which incidentally unhealthy feeling he may have. The believer feels the awesome presence of Allah in his innermost consciousness and his awareness makes him tremble. He therefore attends to self-purification and spiritual cleansing. A refined moral sense, a moral sense is the natural fruit of fresh faith in a just, kind, compassionate, generous and forbearing God who abhors evil and loves goodness and who knows the potative look and the secret thought. From this follows the responsibility of the believer, believer which results from his free will and, its, and the comprehensiveness of Allah's supervision over him. It stimulates within him healthy awareness, sensitivity, serenity and foresight. It is a commu communal responsibility rather than an individual one and is a responsibility towards all humanity in relation to goodness, pure and simple. The believer feels all this in every action. He achieves a higher degree of self-respect and calculates the result before taking any step. He is of value in the world and that the whole realm of existence and has a role in its smooth running. The final quality is man's elevation above greed for worldly gains and the choice of Allah's richer everlasting reward for which all men should strive as the Quran directs them to do so and which results in elevation, purification and cleaning of their souls. Of immense help in this regard is the fact that the believer have a broad scope to move in between this life and the next and between the heavens and the earth. The elevation of, of man lessens his anxiety about the results and the fruits of his deed. He does good only because it is good and because Allah requires it. It is never his concern whether it leads to further goodness in his own short lifetime. Allah, for whom he performed the good, never dies, nor does he forget, nor ignore of man's deed. The reward is not to be received here, for this life is not the last. Thus, the believer acquires the power to continue to perform good deeds, sustained by this overwhelming belief. This is, this, this it is that guarantees that doing good becomes a deliberate way of life and not a casual incidence of motiveless event. It is this belief that supplies the believer with the power and the fortitude to face evil, whether manifested in the despotism, despotism of a tyrant, or in the pleasures of ignorance, or in the frailty of his willpower to control his passions, which arise primarily from his feelings of the shortness of his life to achieve aims and enjoyments, and from his inability 
comprehend the deeper result of the good and witness the victory of rights over evil. Faith tackles this feeling radically and perfectly. Faith is a great root of life from which goodness springs in its various forms and to which all its fruits are bound. What does not spring from faith is a branch cut from a tree. It is bound to fade and perish. It is indeed a devilish production, limited and impermanent. Faith is the exit to which all the fine fabric of life's network is connected. Without it, life is a loose event, wasted to the pursuit of yearnings and fantasies. It is the ideology which collect diversified deeds under a consonant system, following the same route and geared to the same mechanism, possessing a definitive motive and a predetermined goal. Hence, all deeds not stemming from this origin and not related to that path are completely disregarded by the Quran. Islam is invariably candid over this. In Surah 4, Abraham. In Surah 14, Abraham, we read what may be translated as the likeness of those who disbelieve in their Lord. Their works are like ashes which the wind blew which the wind blows previously on a tempestuous day. They have no power over anything they have earned. In Surah 24, the light, we have, as for those who disbelieve, their deeds are like a mirage in a desert. A thirsty traveler thinks it is water, but when he comes near, he finds that it is nothing. Now, these are clear statements discrediting every deed not related to faith, which in turn gives it a motive that is connected with the origin of its existence and an aim that is compatible with the purpose of the world in all creation. This is a logical view of an ideology which attributes all events to Allah. Whoever dissociates himself from Him vanishes and loses the reality of his existence. Faith is a sign of health in a person's nature and soundness in his disposition. It also indicates man's harmony with the nature of the whole universe and a sign of mutual effect between man and its world around him and the world around him. His life, as long as his behavior is straightforward, must bring about an orientation which ends up in his adoption of faith because of what this universe itself possesses of signs and testimonies about the absolute power that so created it. Were the contrary the case, something must then be wrong or lacking in the state of the recipient, i.e. the human being, which would be a sign of corruption that only leads to, to loss and nullifies any deeds which might somehow give an appearance of righteousness. So extensive and comprehensive, so sublime and beautiful, so happy is the believer's world that the world of the unbelievers around appears to him minute, trivial, low, feeble, ugly and miserable. That is in a, in a state of ruin and complete loss. Doing what is righteous is the natural fruits of faith and a spontaneous activity generated at the same time as the reality of faith settles inside the human heart and mind. For faith is a positive and active concept which once it has pervaded the human conscience hasten to activate it to the outside world in good deeds. This is the Islamic view of faith. It must be dynamic. If it is not, then it is neither phony or it is either phony or non-existent. 
just as a flower cannot withhold its fragrance, which if present naturally spreads, or else it is not in the in the flower at all. It is not in the flower at all. From all this, we recognize the values of faith, dynamism, activity, and creativeness and productiveness devoted to Allah's pleasure, and not narrowness, negativity, or isolation into self. It is not just sincere and innocent attention that never develops into action. This is the distinguishing characteristic of Islam that makes it a creative power in practical life. All this is a logical only is all this is logical only as long as faith remains the link with the di divinely ordained path. This path is characterized by perpetual dynamism in the world among people. It is founded according to its specific plan and orientated towards a de de definite goal. Moreover, faith propels humanity towards impl implementing that which is good, pure, constructive, and utilitarian. Counseling one another to, fel to follow the truth and to steadfastness reveals a picture of Islamic society which has its own very special entity, a unique interrelationship between its individual members and a single des destination and which fully understands its entity as well as its duties. It realizes the essence of its faith and what it has to do of good deeds which include among others tasks the leadership of humanity along its own path to execute this tremendous duty counseling and exhortation becomes a necessity from the meaning and nature of the very word counsel appears the loftiest and most magnificent picture of this of the integrated coordinated righteous and enlightened nation or society which caters for right justice and goodness on this earth this exactly is how islam wants the islamic nation to be mutual counsel aimed at that which is right is a necessity because it is hard always to maintain what is right bearing in mind that the obstacles in his ways are innumerable, egoistic passions and predilections, the false concept in the environment and the tyranny, iniquities and despotism of some. Hence, the mutual ex exhortation urge, urges here means reminding, encouraging and expressing the unity in aims and destination and equality in responsibility and charge. It also collects the individual efforts into a unified whole and thus increases the feeling of brotherhood in every guardian, in every guardian of truth, that there are others with him to exhort, encourage, support and love him. This is precisely the case with Islam, the righteous way of life whose establishment requires the care of a coordinated, interdependent, self-sufficient and self-supporting community. Counsel and exhortation to be set by are also a necessity because the sustainers of faith and good deeds and gathering for right and equity are the hardest tasks ever to carry out. This makes endurance utterly indispensable. Endurance is also necessary when adapting oneself to the Islamic way of life and confronting others when afflicted with maltreatment and hardship. That fastness is necessary when evil and falsehood triumph. That fastness is necessary when evil and falsehood triumph. It is necessary for traversing the length of the route, putting up with the slowness of the process of reform, the obscurity of road posts and the lengthy road leading to the destination. Exhortation 
the endurance and steadfastness widens the capacities by inspiring unity of aim and direction and the feeling of togetherness in everyone, equipping them with love, fortitude and determination. It generates vitality in the community where the truth of Islam can survive and to which it is implemented. Judging by the doctrine which the Quran outlines <coughs> for the life of the successful group which attains salvation, we are gravely shocked to see the loss and the ruin in which humanity finds itself everywhere on this earth today. We are shocked by the frustration humanity suffers in this present world and by witnessing how humanity turns away in vain from the goodness Allah has bestowed upon it. We are, we are the more distressed by the absence of a righteous and faithful authority to stand up for the truth. <coughs> Moreover, the Muslims, or rather people claiming to be Muslims, are the furthest of all from what is good and the more averse to the ideology Allah ordained, ordained for their nation and the one root He prescribed for their deliverance from loss and ruin. People in the very realm where this righteousness, righteousness took its root have deserted the banner, of his, the banner of Allah raised for them, that of faith, to raise instead banners of race which have never, which have never done them any good all through their history or given them any reputation either on earth or in the heavens. Islam, it was that raised them the banner totally confer, com, confirming to Allah's will, flying in His name only and identified with Him alone. Under this banner, the Arabs triumphed, were predominant and give humanity a righteous, strong, enlightened and successful leadership for the first time in the history and the long history of humanity. Professor Abu Hassan Ali Nadwi outlines the characteristic of this unique leadership in chapter 3 of his invaluable book, Islam and the World. Once the Muslims were aroused, they quickly burst the bounds of Arabia and threw themselves zealously into the task of the fuller working out of human destiny. Their leadership had the, the guarantee of light and happiness for the world. It gave the promise of turning humanity into a single divinely guided society. Some of the characteristics of Muslim leadership were the Muslims had the unique advantage of being in possession of the divine book, the Quran, and the sacred law, the Sharia. They did not have to fall back on their own judgment on the vital questions of life and were thus safe from the manifold difficulties and perils that are attendant for such a cause. The divine law, the divine world has illum illum illumined all the avenues of life for them and had enabled them to progress towards a destination which they clearly envisage. With them, it was not to be a case of trial and error, says the Holy Quran. Can he who is dead, to whom we give life and a light whereby he can walk among men, be like a him who is in a depth of darkness from which he can never come out? Al Quran, Surah number 6, Ayat 122. They were to judge among men on the basis of revealed work. They were not to diverge from the dictates of justice and equity. Their view was not to be blurred by enmity, hatred, or desire for revenge. O oh, you who believe, stand out firmly for God as a witness to fair dealing, and let not the hatreds of others to you make you swerve to wrong and depart from justice. Be just, that is nearer to piety, and fear God, for God is well acquainted with all that you do. Al-Quran, Surah number 5, 
ayat number 8. They had not been, they had not by themselves leapt into power all of a sudden from the abysmal depth of degradation. The Quran had already bitten them into shape. They had been brought to a high level of nobility and purity by the Prophet through long years of unremitting care. The Prophet had conditioned them to a life of austerity and righteousness. He had instilled into their hearts the virtues of righteousness. He had instilled into their hearts the virtues of humility and courageous self-denial. He had purged them clean of greed and of striving after power, renown or wealth. It was laid down by him as a fundamental principle of Islamic polity that we shall not assign an office under the government to anyone who makes a request for it or shows his longing for it in any other way. We shall not assign an office under the government to anyone who makes a request for it or show his longing for it or in, an, or in any other way. We shall not assign an office under the government to anyone who makes a request for it or shows his longing for it in any other way. <coughs> we shall not assign an office under the government to anyone who makes a request for it or shows his longing for it in any other way. Oh my God! How good it would be if we Muslim of today come to, act, to practice this kind of principle. The Muslims was as far removed from falsehood, haughtiness and mischief as white is from black. The following words of the of the Quran had not in vain had not in vain been granted into them night and day. That home of the hereafter we shall give to those who intend not high-handedness or mischief on earth, and the end is best for the righteous. Al-Quran, Surah 28, Ayat 33 <coughs> Instead of aspiring for positions of authority and trust, they accepted them with great reluctance, and when they did accept an official position, they accept it as a trust from God, to whom they would have to render full account of their sins of omission and commission on the Day of Judgment, says the Holy Quran. God commands you to render back your trust to those to whom they are due, and, we, and when you judge between man and man, that you judge with justice. Al-Quran, Surah number 4, Ayat 58. It is he who has made you his vice-agent on the earth. He has raised you in rank, some above others, that he might try you in the gifts you receive. For your Lord is quick in punishment yet. He is indeed of forgiving, most merciful. Our Quran, chapter 6, uh, Surah 6, Ayat 165. Further, the Muslims were not the agents of any particular race or country, nor were they out to establish Arab imperialism. The mission was a universal mission of faith and freedom. They were happily free from all the sickly obsessions of color and territorial nationality. All men were equal before them, the Quran had pointedly said, O mankind, we created you from a single pair of a male and a female, and made you into nations and tribes, that you may know each other, not that you may despise each other. Verily, the most honored of you in the sight of God is he who is the most righteous of you, and God has full knowledge and is well acquainted with all things. Al-Quran, Surah 49, Ayat 13. Once the son of Amir ibn al-As, the governor of Egypt, struck an Egyptian commoner with a whip 
the matter was brought to the notice of Caliph Umar. <coughs> the Caliph did not show the least regard for the high status of the offender's father and ordered the Egyptian straight away to avenge himself for harm done to him. To the offender's father, he administered this telling rebuke. Why have you made them slave when they were born free? The Arabs were not stingy in making the benefits of faith, culture and learning available to the non-Arab. They did not care for the nationality or the family connection of the recipient when it comes to the conferment of high honours and position in the state. They were, as it were, a cloud of bliss that reigned ungrudgingly over the entire world and from which all peoples everywhere freely profited according to their own capacity. The Arabs allowed a free and equal partnership <coughs> to all nations in the establish establishment of a new socio-political structure and in the advancement of mankind towards a fuller and richer moral ideal. There were no national divisions, no color bars, no vested interests, no priesthood, and no hereditary nobility in the Islamic Commonwealth. <coughs> no special benefits were reserved for anyone. There was nothing to prevent the non-Arabs from surpassing the Arabs in the various fields of life. Even as doctors of fiqh and hadith, a number of non-Arabs attained a distinction to which the Muslims in general and the Arabs in particular feel proud. Ibn Khaldun writes, It is an amazing fact of history that though their, that though their religion is of Abrahamic origin of the law and that the Prophet had brought, had, that the prophet had, brought had an Arab complexion with a few exceptions, all eminent men of learning in the Muslim Millah in the field of theological and well secular sciences are non-Arabic. Even those who are Arabs by birth are non-Arab by education, language and scholarship. <coughs> During the later centuries too, the non-Arab Muslims continued to produce leaders, statesmen, saints and savants of exceptional merits. This would obviously not have been possible had the Arabs been mean or prejudiced in sharing the opportunities with the people of other nationalities in the Islamic world. Humanity has many sides, physical, emotional, social, moral, mental and spiritual. We cannot neglect any one of them for the benefit of another. Humanity cannot progress to its highest level unless every human instinct is brought into proper play. It will be futile to hope for the establishment of a healthy human society till an intellectual, material, moral and spiritual environment is created in which a man is enabled to develop his latent potentialities in harmony with God's plan of creation. We learn from experience that this goal must remain a dream so long as the rings of civilization are not held by those who attach due importance to both the material and the spiritual yearnings of life and can together with having a high moral and spiritual sense fitly appreciate the claims of flesh and blood upon man and the interrelationship between the individual and the society. He then speaks of the reign of the first four caliphs who ruled after the Prophet. <coughs> we consequently find that no period in the recorded history of the human race have been more auspicious for it in the true sense of the term, than what is known among the Muslim as a Khalifa al-Rashidin, that is, the reign of the first four caliphs. During this epoch, all the material, moral and spiritual resources of man were brought into use to make him an ideal citizen of an ideal state. The government was judged by the yardstick of morality, and the morals were judged by the utility to lift humanity in permanent values and establishing justice in human society. Though the Islamic Commonwealth was the richest and the most powerful state of its time, the popular heroes and ideal personalities in it used to be drawn from among those who possess not earthly glory, 
but purity and nobleness of character. There, were no, there was no disparity between power and morality. Material advancement was not allowed to outrun moral progress. This is why in the Islamic world, the incidence of crime was very low in spite of the abundance of wealth and the great heterogeneity of its population. To put it in a nutshell, this epoch was the most beautiful springtime mankind has to this day experienced. We know some features of that glorious period of human history, whose generation live under the Islamic constitution, the pillars of which this particular surah erects and under banner carried by the group of believers to perform righteous deeds and encourage it either to follow the truth and to be steadfast. Now what, in the light of all this, is the loss humanity is suffering everywhere and how great is its failure in a battle between good and evil because of a blind eye it turns to that great message that the Arabs conveyed to it when they raised the banner of Islam and thus assumed the leadership of mankind. Having abandoned Islam, the Arab nation is in the forefront of the caravan which is heading towards loss and ruin. Having abandoned Islam, the Arab nation is in the forefront of the caravan which is heading towards loss and ru ruin. Having abandoned Islam, the Arab nations is in the forefront of the caravan which is heading towards loss and ruin. Since then, the banners of mankind have been for Saturn, falsehood, error, darkness and loss. No banner has been raised for Allah, truth, guidance, light or success. The banner of Allah, however, is still there, awaiting the arms that will raise it and the nation un which under this banner will advance towards righteousness, guidance and success. All that has been said so far concerns gain and loss in this life, which though of great importance, is very trivial in comparison with the hereafter. There is an everlasting life and a world of reality, the real gain and the real loss, the attainment or deprivation of paradise and the pleasure of Allah. There man either accomplishes the highest of perfection allowed for him or completely collapse to that his humanity is crushed and ends up as worthless as pebbles or even worse in condition. On a day when a man will look on what his hands have forwarded and the disbeliever will cry, Would that I were thus? The Quran, Surah 78, Ayat 40. This Surah is inequivocal in indicating the path leading humanity away from loss. Save those who have faith and do righteous deeds and counsel one another to follow the truth and counsel one another to be steadfast. There is no one right path. There is only one, there is one right path and only one, that of faith, good deeds and the existence of a Muslim community whose members counsel each other to follow the truth and to show endurance and steadfastness. Consequently, whenever two companions of the Messenger of Allah were about to depart from each other, they would read the surah, after which they would shake hands. This was indicative of a pledge to accept this doctrine fully, to preserve this faith, piety and a willingness to counsel each other, to follow the truth and remain steadfast. It was a mutual compact to remain good elements in an Islamic society established according to that doctrine and to preserve the foundation of this society. Subhanallah, walhamdulillah, wa la ilaha illallah, wa allah wa akbar, wa la hawla wa la quwata illa billah al-alim azim, wa la hawla wa la quwata illa billah al-alim azim, wa la hawla wa la quwata illa billah al-alim azim. Ya Fattah, Ya Razak, Ya Wahab, Ya Ghani, Ya Mughani, 
Ya Khadim, Ya Daim, Ya Ahad, Ya Wahid, Ya Samad, Ya Rahman, Ya Rahim, Ya Hayu, Ya Qayyum, Ya Rabb, Ya Zal Jalal, Ya Ikram, Ya Rabb, Ya Zal Jalal, Ya Ikram, Ya Rabb, Ya Zal Jalal, Ya Ikram.